Project Management for the Masses podcast, episode 41. Reinvent yourself as a professional with Dory Clark. Project managers, have you ever felt like you should get that promotion or a better job? Start a business, write that book. Have you ever felt you were made for more but didn't know where to start? Welcome to the PM for the Masses podcast with your host, Caesar Abade. Learn from the experts, think outside the box, have a voice, network, and be extraordinary. PM for the Masses podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Project Management for the Masses podcast. My name is Cesar Abade, your host, and this show is your weekly reminder that your career matters more than your job and that your life is a project and you are the manager. Whether you work for a company or for yourself, your job stability is really just your ability to land your next gig. So join me in practicing intentional, planned, and value-adding relevance, starting right now. All right, everybody. Um, I, sorry, for, there's a couple of days here. Uh, I usually release this uh, the, the podcast on Sunday nights, and it's Tuesday night. But ah, uh, oh man, it's uh, baby is not sleeping. It's really, <laughs> it's really stressful. Uh, we're kind of losing our minds here. But uh, but anyway, but here's the here's my latest episode, um, and um, hopefully you're listening to this way into the future and really it's whether i'm a couple days late it doesn't matter but anyway today i'm bringing you a delightful conversation it was really delightful a conversation i had with author coach and public speaker dory clark and my conversation with her is on how and why you should reinvent yourself if you find yourself stuck in your career or if you feel like you would like to take make a fresh start, start over, or change industries, or just do something different, or do something better, you will certainly enjoy this episode. And you know what, I think we all need to keep reinventing ourselves. So even if you don't feel like you're stuck, I think you should listen, I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. And after my chat with Dory, I will also share a new resource for those wanting to break into project management, into the project management industry. And also, I'm going to talk about briefly about my upcoming visit to Dallas to to participate in the podcast movement conference. So how about we get started? Special guest coming up next, pmforthemasses.com, pmforthemasses.com. Dory Clark is the author of Reinventing You, Define Your Brand, Imagine Your Future. A former presidential campaign spokeswoman, she is also a frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review and Forbes. Recognized as a branding expert by the Associated Press and Fortune, Clark is a marketing strategy consultant and speaker for clients including Google, Microsoft, Yale University, Fidelity, and the World Bank. She is an adjunct professor of business administration at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business and has guest lectured at Harvard Business School, the Harvard Kennedy School, Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, the Wharton School, the MIT Sloan School of Management, and more. She is a frequent guest at, on MSNBC and appears in worldwide media including NPR, The Wall Street Journal, and the BBC. And Dory is on the line with me today from San Francisco. Good afternoon, Dory. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. And no, thank you for being here. And actually, it's good morning for you because you're out in San Francisco today. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Up bright and early for you. <laughs> That's right. Now, Dory, uh, I mean, you, 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 uh, you, the content you've, you've been creating is just fantastic. And um, I thought I, I'd bring you here today to talk about reinventing ourselves. You have a book on the topic, and you you talk about this a lot, and uh, this is, is especially important here for for me and and my audience because I know people reach out to me all the time saying that they are either they feeling like they're they're too old or the industry they they worked for uh, twenty years it's ending. Uh, so we have all these people who have uh, who are really competent and um, they're experienced, but they feel like okay now what is it too late you know so. How about we talk about reinventing ourselves? I think there's hope for everybody. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I 
oftentimes hear from people that uh, they're concerned that maybe they're too old to reinvent themselves, that maybe it's fine if you're in your 30s or maybe even your early 40s, but, uh, but you know, oh, if you're older than that, you might not have a chance to do it. And I, I really disagree with that. In fact, one of my most popular blog posts that I ever did for the Harvard Business Review was called How to Reinvent Yourself After 50. It's never too late to do it. And it's more essential than ever to do it because, as you said, the, you know, the economy is changing. Um, you know, companies are starting. Other ones are going out of business. Uh, the nature of the jobs that we perform is really evolving. In fact, in my book, Reinventing You, I interviewed a guy named Stephen Rice, who's the executive vice president for human resources at Juniper Networks in Silicon Valley. And he mentioned that he asks all of the top candidates uh, when he's interviewing uh, them, how are you reinventing yourselves? Because he, he believes that everyone needs to have a good answer to that. And if they don't, he really doesn't want them on the team because he believes that adaptability and flexibility is actually the foundational skill that every professional needs to have in the workforce now. Hmm. Wow. Wouldn't everybody like to have a an interviewer like that at a job interview, huh? Would <laughs> That's right. Ask, That's ask right. good questions. So, so what sparked your interest in, in professional reinvention? Did you have to go through this yourself? Well, I mean, if it's a constant thing for you, but uh, as, as it should be, but what got it started for you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and you raise a great distinction because it's absolutely true. I mean, reinvention is something that in a major way um, probably will, will happen for many people throughout their lives. You know, you might... Uh, lose your job, or you might decide to change careers, or you might want to kind of reposition yourself at a certain point. So there, there may be kind of big reinventions with a capital R, but there also is lowercase r reinvention, which theoretically should be happening all the time. You know, we need to cultivate an attitude of openness, an attitude of growth, where we're, you know, really constantly trying to think of new ways of doing things or f finding ways to take in new information, just, you know, reading voraciously, talking to new people, having a a kind of regular regimen of networking, all of those things are valuable. But for me, the original starting point of my reinvention actually came because my first career was as a journalist. And I got into it. I got hired um, right out of graduate school. It was 2000. And um, it was, you know, it was great. I loved being a journalist. It was actually the height of journalism right then. You know, papers were at their strongest. It was uh, enormously great. And then just, just like a lot of how giants fall um, right after their period of strength, they almost uh, immediately start to show major cracks. And so Craigslist was uh, coming in and starting to take their advertising revenues. And so uh, a year into my job as a newspaper reporter, I got laid off. And I realized, oh, you know, I, I tried to get hired by another paper, but everyone had hiring freezes. And it began to be clear that my plan that I had set out for myself probably was not going to work and that I needed to, uh, to come up with a different strategy, that I had to be flexible and ad adaptable, uh, maybe not even by choice, but that's what was required. And so in the ensuing decade, I had a lot of really cool jobs. I feel, I feel very lucky I was able to be a, a journalist, uh, to work as a uh, campaign uh, spokesperson on a presidential campaign. Uh, I ran a nonprofit. I made a documentary film. And then eight years ago, I started my own consulting business where I speak and write and, and teach for business schools about marketing strategy. Um, so I've done a lot of reinvention and, uh, and that was the original starting point for my book, Reinventing You. But I also, as part of it, interviewed dozens and dozens of other professionals who had reinvented themselves to try to really glean the best practices for it. Mm -hmm. um, how about, um, <clears throat> let's say, someone who is in, in th considering reinventing themselves and maybe starting something new, uh, but they, they feel like they are giving up on, on, on their life's work, you know? Uh, is there a period of mourning? Let, let's say when you left journalism. Uh, did you go to school for journalism? I, I didn't, actually. I you was uh, in graduate school for theology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what I mean, you know, I, I remember when I was little, my dad's an engineer and um, yeah. the economy in Brazil, where we were growing, what I was growing up, was really bad. And he was offered a position to be a salesperson. And I remember him looking at his uh, graduating, uh, uh, looking at his diploma on the wall and just kind of shedding a tear a little bit, you know. Um, yeah. So what do you, what do you have to say to those who maybe feel like that? Yeah. 
Well, it's certainly understandable. And um, I actually, I think the good news is that it's, uh, it doesn't have to be about giving up a dream. Um, there, what, what I've discovered in the new economy is that there are multiple ways to get to it. And so just by way of, of example, um, you know, I, I started out wanting to be a journalist. And interestingly enough, I actually am probably in some ways more of a journalist now than I was then. Um, you know, back then I was, uh, you know, I, I was on staff at a newspaper and I'd write, you know, a big 3,000 word article a week and then maybe one or two small news items. Um, you know, now I'm, I'm probably writing the same volume, if not more. I blog for Forbes. I blog for Harvard Business Review, for Entrepreneur, uh, for the National Center for the Middle Market. So I'm writing a ton. The difference, though, is that the, the field changed, the economics of it changed. And so I'm no longer, I mean, you know, I, I get some money for it, although certainly not equivalent to a full-time journalist's salary. Um, so you, it's really hard to make money as a journalist now. However, I am doing the, the work. I am getting a little money for it. And, uh, you know, here's the interesting part where you have to be kind of uh, entrepreneurial about it is that I'm actually making far more money than I would have as a journalist. But I'm not making money because of literally doing the writing. It's that I do the writing. And as a result of that, I get consulting work and speaking work that enables me to, uh, to make a good living. So I think sometimes you don't have to give up the dream. You just have to give up the path to the dream, and then you can find another path. Mm -hmm. That really resonates with me, actually. Very, very interesting. Mm. So you also talk about uh, personal branding. So the, I, I, you know, I visited your website, and it's your name, and it's your picture. There's a video of you, and, and there's an About You page. How important is it for you to, to, to stand up on your own as a professional, on your own brand as you go from gig to gig? I do think that it's, uh, it's pretty important. Um, I'm actually in San Francisco right now. Uh, I'm staying with a friend of mine, and she works at a company that um, you know, kind of actively discourages employees from developing a strong personal brand. And you know, in her case, she's willing to, to make the trade-off because it's a it's a company that is pretty well known, and so as a result, um, that brand name does open doors. She's able, on an individual level, to um, meet people and make connections that she that she wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. And you know, she feels like they're paying her well. It's good experience, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it does well on the other metrics. Um, but you know, she ha she has to be very deliberate about that trade off because she does recognize that because she can't really cultivate a strong outside perspective, I mean, she's not um, really able to do the kind of public speaking or, you know, writing, you know, blogging online or having a big Twitter presence or things like that. And as a result, uh, that is a kind of handicap. So even if you don't have it, I mean, certainly you can cultivate your personal brand in a variety of other ways. You can cultivate it just through individual one-on-one -on -one networking, and that can be really powerful. That can be um, a way that people in your field can come to know you. But um, thanks to the internet and the power of scale that it enables, if you are, I mean, if, in, you know, if your company doesn't prohibit you from, uh, from getting active, it's a real competitive advantage for you to do so, for you to you know, do things like you are, you know, tweeting and starting a podcast and, and sharing your ideas, because it means that in the broader realm of your field, People know who you are, and you've built a reputation. And so, if you're ever in a position where you know someone's saying, "Oh, should I do business with him?" It's not like you have to prove yourself in that moment. You've already proven yourself, and it makes the sale and the transaction infinitely easier. Mm -hmm. And even if you can't have a website or, or you know be have a, a presence like that, I don't think there's a company that forbids people to be on LinkedIn, for example. You know, right? And exactly. you can, you can have the, your LinkedIn profile kit can be seen as a, as a website, and, and you can interact with people in the groups and answer questions and display your expertise and create a, an online trail of uh, awesomeness for you there. Uh, and that's what I tell people. A lot of people will say, "Well, I'm not comfortable with personal branding." So, what if someone is not really comfortable with actually being out there and putting, you know, their face out there? And what do you what What's your advice? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you you hear that 
a lot from from people. I mean, uh, it's certainly a substantial minority of people um, say that that personal branding makes them a little bit uncomfortable. I think the first thing that we need to do is to really look at why that's the case. And generally, it is because people equate in their minds personal branding with bragging about themselves. And I think that you know, if, if we're going to make any progress at all, I mean, you're not you're not going to make progress if you just tell people, um, you know, oh, well, you should brand yourself, and then, and then you know, they think in their mind like, oh, you're you're telling me to brag. You know, that's exactly the opposite of what my parents taught me to do. I would never <laughs> do that. Um, so you you really have to question the definitions and make sure that everybody's clear about that, uh, because personal branding is not bragging. It's not this sort of wanton dissemination of information about how, how fantastic you are. Um, it's, uh, it's something really different. Um, first of all, what personal branding is, is getting to know yourself and getting really clear about what you are good at, what you are passionate about, and how you can help other people. Um, it, it starts with a kind of internal uh, questioning and an internal knowledge, which I think is valuable for everybody. Um, the next part uh, is beginning to share that with the world. And that's the part that, uh, that people sometimes think um, means you know, that they're going to be foghorning their way into other people's consciousness. But really, it is very different. Um, it's not about saying how great you are. It's about finding ways to, to demonstrate it. And you, you demonstrate it by being helpful. So for instance, um, with you doing this podcast, it, you know, people who listen to it you know, week after week, they're going to, to understand you know your stuff. You're, you are familiar with the trends in your industry. Um, you're on top of things that are a knowledgeable guy. That's a powerful way of doing it. But you're not saying that. You're not you know, s- you know, screaming, hey, I'm, I'm really knowledgeable and an expert. Um, you're demonstrating it to people, and you're giving them value along the way because your listeners are um, able to, to hopefully glean insights that can benefit them. So it's a win-win, and I think too few people recognize that. If they're able to really understand and reframe personal branding as a way of being clear on their own values and how, how they can help others, um, I think that, that hopefully more people would feel willing to engage with it. Hmm. So do you think we come to an age now that, uh, that the nice guy and the nice girl uh, can win? Because when they're nice and they help, uh, their expertise um, you know, shines through and, and they eventually get um, recognized for it. Yeah, I think, I think to a certain extent that's true. I mean, the, the key here... Is that um, is that you are you are putting your, yourself out there um, to do it because you know if you if you are a nice guy or a nice girl and you uh, and you know you you just sort of keep keep quiet and don't share that light with the world then no one outside of your very very immediate circle is going to be aware of it but if you are just you know being your nice likable helpful self but you are um, able to tap the power of scale. If you were able to, you know, just do something and put it on the internet, you know, maybe maybe you're somebody who, in your company, um, people were always emailing you to ask for questions, you know, ask questions about, um, hey, you know, I'm having this technical problem. I don't know how to fix it. And maybe in the past you would, you know, go over to their desk and help them, or you'd send them an email to help them figure it out. That's great. That's really valuable. It is a thousand times more valuable if you do that same thing by instead of sending an email, you post a response on Quora. Or if instead of um, going over to somebody's desk to help them, you uh, make a video of yourself solving the problem and send it to them and post it on YouTube. Because it means you're not just helping one person, you're helping a thousand people. And that's the kind of thing that can, um, that can be tremendously powerful in terms of establishing your personal brand in whatever realm you, uh, you are an expert in. Mm-hmm. So, would you say that the first step in reinventing yourself then is to understand your unique talent and and what you're called to do in the world? Yeah, I think it really does always start with self knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't you can't get very far if you are if you start with a question of oh you know how do I want to be known and you know these, these sort of external measures that um, you know sometimes people when they think of personal branding they think oh like a politician like finger to the wind. It's, you know, it is useful to think about how you want to be known, but, um, but you're not even going to have any clue how to get there unless you start with, well, how am I known now? What, um, you know, what do people really make of me? 
Uh, and you know, what, what am I good at? Um, where do I want to invest my talent? If you are known by everyone as, oh, the great technical expert in your office, but you actually hate being a technical expert, um, you know, that's, I mean, there's a disjunct there and you're going to want to fix that over time and you need to, um, to get clear on where you are now and where you're going so that you can begin to take actions so that people's perceptions over time will change and move in the direction that, they, that you hope that they will. Very good. Now, Dory, I, I, I had an episode a few weeks back in which I, I kind of shared my thoughts on using the web to kind of um, help promote your career and promote yourself as a professional. And you use the same term that I used on my uh, on my episode, which is to create a narrative. Can you talk about mm. that, the, the importance of, of creating a narrative that explains your reinvention? Yeah, absolutely. It, it is really uh, an important piece of it. And it's one of the ones that I think is, is often overlooked by people uh, because they're, you know, they're in a rush to get their, get their brand out there. But uh, if you don't take the time in the beginning to think about the narrative, then it's, it's much harder. Um, it, it becomes sort of more muddled. And so what I mean by creating a narrative is that other people are never, you know, they don't have personal inside information into how you're thinking um, about who you are and where you're going. I mean, we know this, but other people are only seeing outside glimpses, and they're also probably only paying half attention to who you are. So if all of a sudden, you know, you begin to make a, a sort of transition, if you say, you know what, I've been in sales in my company, um, but I really have decided I want to move a little bit more into marketing. Um, you know, I mean, that's not, that's not even a huge shift. But uh, if, if people are used to seeing you as the sales guy, they're going to be a little bit weirded out about, you know, why are you doing this different thing and what does that mean? And they'll be constructing narratives of their own. We're humans. We live by stories. And so they'll be coming up with, you know, all kinds of ideas. Maybe it's, oh, well, you know, he must be uh, moving into marketing because he hates his boss. Or, oh, you know, he, maybe he wants to do marketing because, you know, he's not good at sales anymore. And, you know, they'll come up with these things which are oftentimes just, just really wildly inaccurate. And so we need to seed other people with the correct narrative. We need to help them understand how to see it. And if we do, then odds are they're probably just going to accept it and say, oh, okay, that's great. Um, but if we fail to do it, they'll make up their own and it'll be wrong. So we want to make sure that if we really do want to be the person who's shifting from sales into marketing, that you know, we have a nice explanation where we say, you know, um, I've, you know, I've been in sales for the last eight years and I really love it. Um, but doing so makes me realize that, um, that I have a lot to contribute in terms of the overall brand strategy of the, the company. And I'm really excited to explore that because it, it means that uh, if I can make an impact in branding, then uh, that upstream work will help us sell hundreds of thousands more units long term. So I really want to be part of, of that team effort. And, you know, you just say something like that and they say, oh, you know, he wants to do that because he's, uh, he wants to make a bigger impact in the company. And then all of a sudden it makes sense and it's far better than whatever they could come up with. Yeah. And I, I think it's just so attractive too, when someone comes to you and tells you, uh, um, the, the, their story and, and how intentional they're being about kind of, you know, moving in a direction. I mean, yeah. that, that's wildly different from, from the average, you know? Yes. And, and, and the other thing, as you were t telling me about that, I think also that uh, everybody has their own narrative in their own minds. And, uh, and that includes how they see you as part of their narrative. So when you come out and you tell them, no, actually, my story is this one. Mm -hmm. They go like, "Oh, okay," and and uh, and I believe that people uh, enjoy a story. That's why I think that's why there are so many more movie goers than movie makers. You know. <laughs> yes. So if you're in the position to actually, okay, no, no, this is this is my narrative, and this is what I'm doing to kind of explain it to people and and and, and make a difference. I think that makes you very very attractive to an employer or to you know f for people around you to work with you. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. All right. So, so that's, so we kind of established that that's important and kind of, you know, uh, figure out the best, the first steps. So what if someone has been working hard already on, on, on reinventing themselves or on their personal brand, but it seems like no one notices and, or nobody cares. Yeah. So how, how, how can you, <laughs> how can you, uh, get people to pay attention? Yeah, it's, it's an important question because, 
Um, it's very true. I mean, people, uh, you, you hear that sometimes, that if people don't get a sort of immediate feedback on their rebranding efforts, that uh, it's easy to become discouraged and to say, well, you know, why am I bothering? Um, this, you know, this isn't necessarily easy, and why am I spending the time doing this if it's not going to have a result? And so I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One <laughs> is that the changes that we're making, because we are in our heads 24-7, the changes usually seem much more dramatic to us than they do to other people. And so we might think, oh, we've made this huge change and no one's noticed. But other people probably perceive it as a little bit smaller. And so we've got to, you know, that, that's why it's useful to have really trusted friends in the process. I talk in Reinventing You about uh, the importance of having a wingman. And, uh, you know, what I, what I mean by that, there's, uh, there's research that's been done that shows that if you have, uh, basically, if, if you are perceived as bragging about yourself, other people, you know, won't really respond to it well. Obviously, they won't like you. They won't listen to you. But if you have somebody else who is talking you up and saying great things about you, that really sinks in. And people say, oh, this person's fantastic. And so it's useful to have a wingman who is a really trusted friend that will talk you up in social situations and where you can do the same for them. And so similarly, you know, with that person that you obviously have a strong rapport with, um, they can be a useful sounding board where you can check in with them and say, hey, look, you know, I've been trying you know, X, Y, Z. I'm not getting any, uh, any results. And you know, maybe it's just that, that you think that it's bigger, bigger of a deal than it's coming off to other people. So keeping that perspective in mind is useful. The other thing is that um, there's a question of timing. Uh, because you know we can't reinvent our brands overnight. Um, it does take time. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily take as much time as you might imagine. It's not like uh, you know. I mean, in most cases, you don't have to like. Oh, I need to go back to school and get a PhD so I can reinvent myself in nine years. Um, that's fortunately not not usually necessary. Uh, but you know, let's say you needed to make a behavioral change where maybe you were um, a, you know a little too abrupt with your colleagues and you want to try to do a better job of keeping your temper in check. Uh, that's something that, um, you know, if you're doing it for a week or two, that's not enough pattern for your colleagues to pick up on. It'll probably take, you know, a couple of months for people to really begin to see a difference that, you know, oh, wow, she's, she's not blowing up at me the way that she used to. Whereas if, if you don't do it once, they might say, oh, well, maybe she was just in a particularly good mood. But if you don't do it for th three months, then they say, wow, she's really made a behavioral change. Mm -hmm. So consistency and support. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so how, how do you, so I, I've, I've been uh, a part of mastermind groups and that's a great way to kind of connect with people and, and bounce ideas off of somebody else who's outside of your brain. Do you have any tips of, of, of finding that wingman? Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of, of how to find a wingman, I think that, you know, it really comes down to trust in a lot of ways. You want to make sure that there's somebody who meets a couple of criteria. One is that you like them and respect them and trust them as a person. You, uh, you don't want to be tapping somebody that's a frenemy or that you suspect might be in any way. Um, you want somebody that you legitimately know they have your back. And when it is their job to sort of be be going out there and representing you and talking you up, you know that they are going to be doing a good job of it with the right motives, not uh, some weird hidden agenda. Um, so that's number one. And then number two, hopefully uh, the person that you choose is somebody who is also uh, shares the same kind of goals and motivations for, uh, for professional success. And, you know, I don't mean that the person has to be, you know, super type A go-getter, but you want it to be somebody who understands the value of cultivating a positive workplace reputation and somebody who, who gets it that, you know, it, yeah, it really does matter that when you're at a, at a cocktail party or a networking event, um, I mean, you could be wasting your time just kind of bloviating about, uh, you know, baseball scores or something like that. Um, and that's one way to do it. You know, plenty of people get through that way, but it would be a lot better if you use the time strategically to help your friend advance their career uh, and you know, to, to really get why it is important to be a good wingman. So if you have somebody who meets those criteria, that, that would be a really good choice. 
Very good. One thing that I found by doing this podcast is, um, um, and, and I tell people like, you need to kind of find the, uh, find the, the, the reward in, in helping others and finding the joy there, you know, without uh, ulterior motives. Cause That's then, you, right. cause now you find then you can find yourself helping a lot of people, not expecting anything in return. And then when it's time for you to, to, to actually ask for something, you know, for referral or recommendation, then, um, you've deposited a lot into our, into your account for you. You can go and make a withdrawal, right? Yeah, exactly. Very good. So let's talk about social media quickly, because, um, is it really necessary that people need to be on social media when they are reinventing themselves in this day and age? Well, you know, I, I would say that it is not, uh, 100% mandatory. I mean, if, if for some reason you're in a position like, like my friend whose company is a very secretive company, um, let's say you work in an industry, that uh, is highly regulated or something where it's, it's just a little tricky. Maybe you do defense related work or something like that. It does become harder. And so I don't want to tell people, oh, you absolutely have to do it. And you know, your life will be ruined if you don't, if you don't do social media, because some people just really can't. But that being said, if you have the ability to do it, if there are not structural impediments, then you should do it because it really is a competitive advantage. It really is a way that you can distinguish yourself, that you can get your ideas out there. And, you know, many people, even people who, um, you know, do theoretically have the ability to do so, they're not prohibited by their employer from doing so, they just don't because they're busy, they're lazy, they're tired, they don't know how. And so if you make the effort, even though, you know, we hear, oh, it's so crowded, there's so many blogs and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's true. But you don't necessarily need to make an impact where, you know, you are the most famous blogger in the world. It is uh, useful for people to make a niche impact. And so, for instance, I, you know, I, I know you do things in the construction industry. And being known as an expert in project management and, you know, particularly if we focus in on the construction industry, that's a really powerful niche. You don't need to be mobbed in grocery stores. You just need to be, when somebody is is Googling your name and when somebody is uh, Googling your industry, if your stuff comes up, that's, that's really great because it establishes you as an expert in the realm in which you want to be known as an expert. And that's a kind of career insurance that, uh, that money can't buy. Awesome. Yeah. It's, um, you're nodding my head. (laughs) (laughs) Very, very good. Now, Dory, for, for those listening right now who are discouraged, uh, I have, People, you know, I think they know who I'm talking about because they've, I've been having conversations offline with people who are really discouraged with the economy, yeah. with their situation, and they feel like um, they're tired and they're not seeing results and they feel maybe they need to reinvent themselves, but they don't, don't feel like they have the energy or the desire or, or they don't feel like they can do it. What is, do you have a number one tip, like a, maybe a first step that they can do towards getting out of that funk? Yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, there's been a lot of research by a woman professor at Harvard Business School named Teresa Amabile, and she talks about the fact that one of the most motivating things that people can experience is a sense of progress. And so, you know, the, the question is, how can you create that? Because people, you know, maybe they've been trying things and they keep hitting a wall. They don't feel any progress at all. And so, of course, it gets discouraging. So you want to find a way to, uh, to really sort of kickstart the process of feeling like you're moving forward. And so one easy thing that I would suggest that I think really can be helpful is, um, is just start by building your network. And I, I have a friend who used to work at a big research hospital, and she decided to do something very simple but I think very powerful, which is that she decided she was going to have lunch with a different person in a different department once a week. You know, that, that was it. It was one hour a week of networking. But if you think about it, over the course of a year, you're going to have built a really tremendously powerful and diverse network. And so, you know, I, I think it's often very energizing, too, because you, um, you're meeting new people, you're getting exposed to new ideas. Um, presumably, these should all pe- be people that you think are at least reasonably interesting folks. And so you're, you're going to be learning things about your company or about your industry that you wouldn't otherwise. And so just 
just, you know, beginning the process of seeing what other people are doing, meeting new folks, um, you know, getting, getting their advice. I mean, you don't even have to start. Let's say you've, you've been trying to reinvent yourself. It's, you know, it's frustrating. Just commit to one hour a week. And then when you're with these people, really ask questions, really get to know them. And, you know, maybe you can pick people who have reinvented themselves or done some rebranding. And you can ask them questions about their process. And I'm willing to bet that the, that the act of reaching out, the act of finding out what they've done is probably going to be fairly inspiring and uh, maybe will you know, make you excited to try some of the techniques that they've used. Very good. Now, Dory, if someone uh, wants to learn more about uh, reinventing themselves and maybe more about you and what you do, where should they go? Yeah, thank you. Well, I have a website that has li literally hundreds. I have more than 400 free articles and over 160 free podcasts available on it. So hopefully there'll be some resources that people can uh, enjoy. The website is doryclark.com, D-O-R-I-E-C-L-A-R-K. I'm on Twitter also and pretty active there, at Dory Clark. And my book is called Reinventing You, and that's available on uh, Amazon and Barnes & Noble and many uh, independent and real-world bookstores as well. Very good. And I'm, I'm going to add all these links to the show notes for today's episode. And, um, and the listener can find it at pmforthemasses.com. And just look for the episode here with Dory Clark. And you'll find all the links there. Dory, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's a pleasure talking to you. And um, I'd love to have you back on the show later on to maybe talk about your next book. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. You are listening to the PM for the Masses podcast. All right, so I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dory. Um, if you've been listening to this to this podcast, you know for for a while, you can see how her message is really in line with everything that we talk about here, about standing out, about um, networking, and and um, and really like taking taking charge of your career. You know, life is a project; you're the manager, right? <laughs> so, um, so I, I also recommend you checking out her book, which is again called "Reinventing You." I'll have a link to her book and website in the show notes for today's episode at pmforthemasses.com slash 41. And I'm adding her book to my Kindle queue and, and I will be reading it soon. And if you do get it, hop onto our Google Plus community and uh, and tell us about it. You know, I have a little mini book club there if, you, if you'd like. And you can find the, our Google Plus community at pmforthemasses.com slash Google. Oh, if you go, if you go to pmforthemasses.com, you'll see the, the banner on the right-hand side there for, for you to go and join the Google Plus community. There is almost uh, 300 people there now, and uh, it's pretty cool. All right, so let me tell you about a new resource that was just made available just a couple of days ago. It's a free ebook that was put together by my friend and also past guest here on the show, Jeff Crane. If you remember, he was on, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe f uh, four or five weeks ago. He was uh, our guest here. He talked about uh, getting people to work together. It was a great uh, conversation there. And this ebook is called 52 Tips to Break into Project Management. Pretty straightforward. And the way that he did this, he invited 52 project management experts uh, and practitioners and asked them to share uh, a couple of tips uh, for people who are wanting to break into into this profession. Now, just a little bit of a background in case you missed my interview with Jeff. He is a, a professor. He's a he teaches at he teaches project management at a, a, a local college here in Ontario. So the idea is to 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 write this ebook to so he can give this to his project management students. But also he also made it available to to the world basically for free. And uh, really, it's making a big splash. You're going to be hearing about this ebook um, <laughs> from uh, from different sources. So I was actually fortunate enough to to be invited by Jeff to be a part of this. So uh, and I think I don't know if he organized this in alphabetical order, <laughs> but my contribution is the first one in the book. So I was surprised to see that. Uh, I usually, if it's alphabetical order, I'm usually first because of my last name is A B, right? <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I'm very happy with with the quality. Of of the book that he produced. I mean, the content is great, but also he's a talented um, desktop publisher too. I mean, the book is just uh, beautiful. Again, the book is called 52 Tips to Break into Project Management, and you can find a link to it 
at pmforthemasses.com slash 41, which again is the show notes for today's episode. Now, one more thing I'd like to share with you before I go is um, that I will be speaking in Dallas, Texas this August at the first podcast movement conference. This is the first national conference that is dedicated to podcasters, as far as I know. Um, if you've been listening to the show, you probably remember that last year I was a speaker at New Media Expo in Las Vegas. New Media Expo is like um, it's a conference for con- online content creators, basically people who are podcasting or are blogging and also who have video channels. And the podcast movement is a little bit of a spin off from that. So basically taking a subset of New Media Expo. So it's basically a, a party for podcasters. And um, I'll be speaking there, uh, which is a great honor. There was a lot of people who applied to speak and they, they accepted my, my uh, submission there. And my talk is going to be called Project Management for the Podcaster. <laughs> and uh, basically I'm going to be sharing you know some basics of project management so podcasters can also... Uh, you know, take take their dreams of the, for, for services and products and, and shows and different things and turn them into reality by using good project management. And this is really really cool because it makes me excited. You know, to, to continue to to this work that I have here as a, as a project management evangelist. You know, and bringing project management to industries and niches that are n- not necessarily familiar with it. So. Um, I'm working on that talk right now. It should be cool. And you can find all the information about this conference at podcastmovement.com. And again, I'll have a link to that in the show notes for today's show, today's episode. So that's it for the show today. I hope you enjoyed it. And just a quick update on my book. I'm still working on writing it and launching it. So, and, and I'll also have some exciting news for you. Um, hopefully on the next episode regarding some new content that I'll be creating around this this book, around, around writing and publishing this book. And I think you will enjoy what's coming down the, the pipeline for me and for project management for the masses. So let's talk again next week. And until then, keep reinventing yourself. And remember that life is a project and you are the manager. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for listening to the PM for the Masses podcast. Tune in next week for more great ideas on how to manage your projects better and truly stand out in your industry. PMforthemasses.com